Okay, so those watching on YouTube, I have I, I was playing in an OTB tournament, and I've been sick, so I've paused the speed run for a bit. But we are back. Just really quickly, the story behind this name is an expression that I sometimes use, which is like the way that I was explaining certain maneuvers by pieces. Like sometimes you have to make a retreating move, and I compared it to flying through different airports. But anyways, I won't delve into it right now. Let's go. Okay, we're white against the 1200. No, this guy's not provisional, so we're good. And we're going to play e4. So once again, here I am playing my official opening recommendations against all openings. And against the Sicilian, I've recommended both the Alapin as well as the Smith Mora. It's been a while since we've actually played the Alapin, and I feel more comfortable kind of officially recommending the Alapin because I know it better. And the Smith Mora and the Alapin are, in many cases, one and the same. Uh, in case Black plays Knight F6, the Smith Mora and the Alapin are the same opening. Uh, but of course, against the immediate C3, Black has many other systems. The other main system is d7, d5 here, which has fallen, I think, a little bit out of favor in recent years, but still has a very good reputation. Knight f6 and, and d5 are the two, the, the only two moves that are considered to equalize comfortably, but even they, uh, you know, obviously lead to very, very interesting play. Knight f6 is our opponent's choice. Impressive. Okay, so of course the move here is e5. And now the knight swings over to d5, kind of Alakine style. This is sort of an Alakine with the inclusion of the moves c3 and c5, which obviously favors black because c3 is the square that we want to use for the development of our knight. Um, and c5 is a move that grabs space in the center. And now we play the move d4. We occupy the center with our pawns. This is the idea of c3. And if black plays c takes d4, uh, then we officially transpose into the Mora. You could think about the Mora move order uh, if you had started with d4, cd4. Okay, cd4 is on the board. So this is theory. And as I've explained before, it, the first thing to remember is that white does not actually need to recapture immediately. It's not a mistake to play cd. Um, and there is even the move queen takes d4, which I think Mark Esterman recommends in his in his Mora book. He, he devotes a little bit of time to it. But the main line is actually to leave this d4 pawn alone for the time being, using the fact that the knight on d5 is spin. dc is not a threat. And instead, we just proceed with our development with a very flexible move, knight f3. This keeps maximum flexibility. And as I've shared before, in the opening, you want to start with the most flexible moves, the moves that you know are not going to cost you, the moves you know you want to play anyway. And knight f3 is just such a move because, well, you need to protect the e5 pawn. This knight is never really going to go out to e2. So this is a very flexible move. We wait for black to put their cards on the table, and then we proceed. Knight c6, our opponent is following the main line. All right. Now we can continue keeping this pawn on d4, but there's no more utility in that. And this is a good moment to remove the tension in the center by taking on d4. That is just the main line. We're, we're following theory. So we play c takes d4. And Sicilian players who know theory with black know that the two main moves here for black are d6, immediately chipping away at white's central pawn mass. Otherwise, if this pawn mass starts moving forward, the knights can get pushed out of their seemingly unassailable squares. And the second move is e6. Black can start with e6 in order to secure this knight on d5 first, kind of an antidote against bishop c4. But black plays a third move, g6. Also a pretty viable move, actually. Uh, nothing terribly wrong with it. Nothing terribly wrong with it, but... This is, I think, considered a little bit inaccurate because it's a little slow, first of all, right? It's a, it's a two-move developing move. And second of all, even if Black Fianchettos is bishop to g7, uh, the bishop is kind of going to be staring at this pawn chain. It's going to be biting on granite. It's going to be a granite, granite biter. So we have several ways to proceed. We have 
many developing moves that come to mind. I think most of you are probably most attracted to the move bishop c4, which is probably the move we're going to end up playing. There is also nothing wrong with just playing knight c3. Knight c3 is a, is a totally viable move that will likely lead to a trade, knight takes c3 bc, and it'll further solidify our pawn chain, so that is an alternative that I quite like. But bishop c4 just seems to be a little bit more, you know, it carries a little more power because it forces the knight back, essentially. Or if black plays e6, then black has combined the moves e6 and g6, and as we've discussed, that leaves black very exposed and vulnerable on a lot of these dark squares in the center, f6 and d6. We can try to get our knight potentially then to, to d6 or to f6. So this already poses black with a decision. Um, my guess is that knight b6 is going to follow. No real other moves. I mean, knight c7, I guess, is possible, but that's uh, not a tempo move. And considering how slowly black is developing, black can hardly afford to play that. Knight b6. So, of course, we want to stay on this diagonal, right? We want to stay on this diagonal, so we drop the bishop back to, F, uh, to b3. Is there a bishop sack on f7? Some of you may be wondering. I think the answer is no. I... I, I'm not aware that this works. Bishop f7, king f7. There's another check on g5. The king just runs back to g8. And if you move your queen out to f3 in that line, then black can slide his queen over to e8. So I don't think that line works. I'm very impressed the way our opponent is handling the opening thus far. I mean, this is, this is pretty advanced stuff. d6, chipping away at our center. So let me think for a little while here. How do we want to handle this position. This is kind of an isolated queen pawn position in the making, potentially. Uh, and it will actually reach an IQP position if we play e takes d6. So if we play ed, black will probably recapture with the queen. And then we will get this isolated queen pawn on d4, which is a very common structure that occurs out of the Alapin in, in many, many cases. But we don't have to play e takes d6. First of all, black is not technically threatening d takes e5. That forces a queen trade, but it doesn't win a pawn. We have two defenders on e5, and black has two attackers. So an alternative would be just a castle kingside. And, you know, the reason for castling kingside would be that after d e5, d e5, in the event that black takes our queen, we can recapture with the rook and put the rook on a nice open file. But that endgame doesn't seem all that, you know, appealing to me. It just doesn't seem like it's in the spirit of the position. I want to keep the queens on the board. So let's look for other alternatives. Well, another alternative would be to target the pawn on f7 using the fact that black, you know, has delayed the kingside development. So we can think about the move knight g5. That, that should occur to most people. Um, and then there's another move that I think we're going to end up playing which uh, Mamba on Discord has just pointed out. So knight g5 hits f7. Black can defend by pushing the pawn out to e6. And then we can continue attacking with queen f3. Can black defend f7 in that position? Yes, black can slide his own queen up, let's say, to c7. And if you look carefully at the resulting position, it gets very, very sharp. It gets messy. But what, what bothers me is that the d4 pawn is going to end up hanging because we've moved our knight away and we've moved our queen away. And we cannot afford to lose the d4 pawn unless there's a very compelling reason to do so. So there is a third move here that I really like, and this is a subtle move. This is not a move that I think most beginners would necessarily stumble on because it doesn't necessarily have the kind of ring. It, it doesn't look immediately obvious or maybe even immediately logical. Now, as I pointed out earlier, the idea of the move d6 is to play d takes e5. And the reason d takes e5 is annoying is because it essentially forces a queen trade, right? After d e5, black can take the queen on d1, and we have to recapture awkwardly. And we also don't want to exchange queens because we have more space. We have more space in the center, and the effect of a space advantage is greatly diminished if the queens are off the board. We just have less pieces with which to attack. So how do we actually avoid a queen trade? Well, by moving our queen. Where, to move, where do we move it? Well, it makes sense to support the central pawn mass with the move queen to e2. This is, I think, a very sensible 
sensible move that keeps keeps the tension and keeps the queens on the board. Now, in order to make this move work, you need to be familiar with a very typical tactic that occurs in the event of bishop g4, a move that a ton of people in like the 800, 900 range would play pretty automatically. Let's pin the knight and you might get excited by the threat of knight takes d4. But bishop g4 runs into a, a super thematic tactical sequence. Black does not fall for it. Bishop takes f7. Very good. Yeah, bishop takes f7 and knight g5. I'll show you after the game, so don't worry about not visualizing it. But for now, we can continue our development. And let's just castle kingside. And note that once black castles kingside, bishop g4 actually becomes a very unpleasant idea. And it's not unpleasant because we risk losing our knight, right? As I've pointed out before, one easy way to evaluate the danger of a pin is, first of all, to see whether the pinned piece is protected by a pawn. And the second thing is whether the pinned piece can be attacked by an enemy pawn. Answer to the first question is yes. Answer to the second question is no. The knight is not in danger, but our center is, because this knight is an integral defender of both of these pawns. And so at this point, we have to prevent bishop g4 at all costs. And so the move h3 is a very important one to throw in. Hopefully that logic makes sense. After bishop g4, knight takes d4 would have been a big threat, as would d takes e5. All right. So I would say white's maybe a tiny bit better here. We've got a little bit more space in the center. We've got a nice bishop on b3 aiming at f7. We still need to develop our queen side. And another move that I'm thinking about is rook f1 to d1, just to position our rook on a nice square, support the base of the pawn chain, and, and put some pressure uh, on black's queen. Notice that the c file is actually open, which may not seem significant right now because there's nothing really going on on the c file. But later on in the game, if black drives his queen out to c7, we might be able to carry out a plan based on quickly getting our minor pieces out and then putting a rook also on c1 uh, and putting more pressure on the queen. So that might happen later down the line. Why aren't we developing our queen side pieces? Well, we had more important things to do, right? I was explaining the logic behind every move. It was more important to prevent bishop g4 than to urgently develop the queen side pieces. This, the, it, I think we're... Everything in the position is defended, so I think we're fine. Okay, de, we of course recapture with the pawn. We don't take back with a knight here. That would just drop the d4 pawn. So we take back with a pawn. And the d file now opens up as well, raising the, increasing the appeal of the move rook d1, which we might actually play next to drive the queen to c7. It goes there anyway. Okay, queen c7. So now this, of course, attacks the e5 pawn. Now this attacks the e5 pawn, forcing our hand. One, two, three attackers. One, two, defenders. So there's like two ways to defend the e5 pawn. You can play rook e1, but that's passive. You want to accomplish more than one task at the same time if possible. And here there is the move bishop f4, which simultaneously does three things. It develops the bishop, it protects the pawn, and it sets up a potential x-ray against black screen. Now you might say, well, I see that e6 is a possibility, but the bishop's going to be hanging. And again, it's not just about the short-term ideas, but about the long-term ideas as well. Maybe later, you'll be able to tuck your bishop away onto a defended square such as h2. Very typical kind of move in the London, many different openings. And then e6 might become a very devastating threat. So, uh, you know, so, so we're setting up potential tactical ideas in this position as well. Okay. And black is cramped. The bishop on g7 is still biting on granite. I mean, the move I would play with black is just bishop to f5, develop black's own, complete black's own development. And if black handles this position very carefully, I think black can equalize. Our opponent is doing just that. Because we've got two main options. The first simple option, and this is the obvious continuation, it's just to play the move knight c3. Okay, we can play knight c3. And we probably will end up playing that move, by the way. Just develop our pieces. There is also the move g2, g4. We can chase the bishop out of f5. We can say, get off me. Get out of there. 
And given how cramped black is, there aren't that many appealing options for where the bishop can go. Now, when a beginner or a player is just starting, here's a move like g4. They think a move like that is totally out of the question because you move a pawn right in front of your own king. But again, it's not like black has all that much going on on the king side, whereas we have all this beef sitting there on the king side ready to secure the king even further. So g4 is not out of the question. I would consider it. But it's a little bit too outlandish, right? We'll have the time and the place to make such moves later down the line in the speed run. For now, I want to play in more of a fundamentally sound fashion. So let's just go knight c3. Of course, we should be careful about the possibility of bishop to d3. And that's a tactical blunder. So remember a little bit earlier I pointed out that there's this possibility of playing e6. One important skill that you should try to start developing is to generalize ideas, right? E6 is an idea, but you have to be able to connect this core idea to potential tactical executions. So why is E6 strong? Well, because it opens up an attack on Black's queen. Well, under what circumstances would it be even stronger? Well, it would be even stronger if the move E6 itself carried a threat as well. Then that would be a double attack on something as well as the queen. And what could it be attacking? Well, hopefully you already see the move. I'm kind of guiding you in the right direction. Combine that with the fact that we know there's a lot of pressure on F7. The rook has moved away from F8. What was the rook doing there? It was protecting the F7 pawn. We can play bishop takes F7, a classic tactic. If king takes F7, then E6 is a discovery against the queen. And black, therefore, will have to drop the king back to H8. But that is a disastrous pawn to lose. Because once black loses that pawn, the floodgates kind of open on the king side. The game is far from over if black plays king h8. But this is a big step in the right direction for us. And we can immediately try to launch an attack afterward. As a matter of fact, it's really not that simple after king h8. Because there's a couple of logistical problems in our position that we'll need to solve. I will need to actually think after king g8, believe it or not. Or I'm already thinking about what we're going to do after king h8. Yeah, so our opponent is still still shell-shocked a little bit, I think. Well, king f8... It, king f8 puts the king closer to the general danger zone. And there's also this very weak e6 square that has been weakened as a result of the fact that we've just captured the pawn that was defending it. And king f8 puts the king and the queen on forkable square, so it makes an idea like knight g5 even stronger. Now you might say, well, king h8 does the same thing. If the bishop moves out of f7 at some point, then maybe the knight can jump into f7. And absolutely, that's going to be an idea, which is why my initial temptation after king h8 is actually just to go knight g5 straight away. Just go for the attack. But there's some complicating factors here. Knight g5 drops the e5 pawn. So we have to be careful about that pawn. We also have to be careful about an idea I mentioned earlier, bishop f5 to d3 which is not to be trifled with. That pins the queen to the rook and wins at least an exchange. The third thing that we need to be very careful about is that this bishop on f7 is far from safe, and black threatens to play e6, which I will fully admit I missed when we were taking on f7. That traps the bishop and simultaneously attacks it with the queen. Okay, so let's think for a second. We might have to end up making a small sacrifice here. Okay, I have an idea. This is positionally pretty deep. So we won't be able to, help to save everything at once. That's the general observation that you should make, which is that black has all these threats. E6 is one threat. Bishop to D3 is the other threat. Now, I pointed out that the sort of stock attacking formation in such situations is to move the bishop away and then go knight G5 and knight F7. So... It's very important for attacking purposes to preserve your light squared bishop. Why is that? Not only because it sets up these discoveries after knight f7, but also because it just keeps the black king stuck in the corner. It keeps the black king stuck on, on h8. So what we're going to do here is actually move the bishop back straight away. I'm not totally convinced that this is the top engine move. We'll check after the game. But I'm... Pretty convinced that this keeps a big advantage right. Even though it is a sacrifice, it is a flat-out, genuine, you know, sacrifice. We're sacking the exchange, right? We're allowing bishop to d3, and then bishop takes f1. So 
We're sacrificing the exchange, but remember that we've already won a pawn and we're going to have a massive attack, a massive long-term attack uh, after black picks up the exchange on F1. And an exchange sacrifice is really not that big of a deal. It's, it's not a rook. It's not a piece. Okay, black takes it. Uh, our opponent playing easily at a 2,000 level thus far. So this has been really, really fun. Now we should pause here for a second to make sure we should pause here for a second to make sure that knight g5 immediately isn't very strong, but it's actually not, he or she, it's actually not very, very strong because of bishop to c4, bishop comes back to c4, intercepting our bishop on b3. So we actually need to take a tempo to eliminate the light squared bishop so that our bishop remains uncontested on this diagonal. And on the next move, of course, probably we're going to end up playing knight g5. Unless black plays makes the very strong move knight c6 to a5, which is not an easy move, attacking the bishop on b3 and trying to dislodge it from this diagonal. And then I think we have a very strong response in return. Yeah, we can handle, maybe our opponent is speedrunning as well. But I think, I think black is in big trouble here. I think, I think practically speaking, black is in huge trouble. Just because, I mean, look at the buildup of pieces all over the place that are all aiming at the king side. I mean, if black can hold this, then I'm tipping my hat. I'll tell you that the move I would play with black, I really don't think our opponent's going to play it as rook d8 to f8. I'll explain that move after the game. That just might seem very mysterious to you. Like, why are we moving the rook away from an open file? But if I were playing black here, I think the best defensive approach might be to go rook f8. Let's see what our opponent comes up with, though. Again, it, it, barring a move that creates a threat, our next move is going to be knight to g5. This should make sense to everybody. We have a bunch of other ideas. Of course, bringing the knight to f7 or to e6 isn't the only idea of the move knight g5. Notice that the knight also aims at the h7 pawn. So what can we do? Well, we can also then bring the queen over to h4. Another very thematic attacking idea and just launch a, a frontal attack against the h7 pawn. So there's just an, an abundance of tactical ideas here for white. And again, it, it's super important to point out if you're a newer player that we haven't sacrificed that much. We have sacked an exchange, which is a bishop for a rook, but we also have a pawn. So from a material standpoint, it's like we've sacrificed one point of material. It's really not that big of a deal. What, what does that really mean? It means even if our subsequent attack were to backfire, the game wouldn't automatically end. I mean, the game would continue. We have a lot of positional assets as well. We still have more space in the center. Black Steel has pretty shoddy pieces. So we haven't made that big of an investment here. I don't feel that nervous. And you should always remember that. You know, when you sacrifice anything, it's like, what have I sacrificed? And if it's really not that much, then you shouldn't throw all of your eggs in one basket or panic if your subsequent attack doesn't work out. Which is, I think, a very common type of problem at many levels. It's like when a pawn is sacrificed and then you don't checkmate in two moves, you know, people panic and just throw all of their pieces at their opponent. Okay. No, 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 no. He, this guy's 150% legit. I just, I just think he's genuinely underrated. Knight a5. Okay. So here we need to prioritize. And we have a couple of good moves here. We can keep a huge advantage with the move. We can keep a huge advantage with the move knight to g5. Um, and if we calculate the variations, knight g5... Black is probably going to play knight takes b3. And then we can play knight f7 check. That's an intermezzo in, in between move. King g8. Another in between move. We take the rook on d8. But then in that resulting position, black can move the b3 knight back to c5. I'll show this after the game as well. So you don't have to worry if you're not visualizing this. And things again get a little bit messy. I think white can get out of that preserving an, at least an extra pawn as well as an attack. But I think there's a move that looks more fun. And the move that looks more fun, although I'm not entirely sold on 
whether we should play it is actually bishop b3 to e6. Yeah, bishop e6. In order to keep the bishop on this diagonal, now you might ask, well, why not bishop f7 then? But remember, what's the f7 square going to be used for? We want to leave it vacant for the knight. Very important to do that. What's also good about bishop b6 is that the move knight g5 defends the bishop. So after bishop e6, queen c6, we can still play the move knight g5 without having to worry about losing our bishop. So let's set it up with bishop e6. Let's try it. It's a risky move. The more conservative approach would have just been to go knight g5 straight away. But, you know, we're trying to play good attacking chess here. And time is starting to run low for both of us. So this is even more dangerous in time pressure. Is knight c4 concerning? Well, that's what most of you are probably wondering. Like, what are we going to do if black plays knight a to c4? Well, knight c4, we can just play queen back to e2. We can even bring the queen back to c1. The queen is not really an integral attacker here, which is fun funny. The, the, the main part of the attack right now is being conducted by the bishop on e6 and the knight on f3. These two pieces are handling themselves incredibly well. The queen is just sort of there as a glue piece to support all of the other minor pieces, make sure they're not too loose. So after knight a c4, the ideal square for the queen would be e4. But after queen e4, you always have to be careful about moving your queen into too vulnerable of a position because then you run the risk of walking into a, a queen trade. So queen e4 would be a great example of that. After queen e4, black has this nasty response, queen to c6. And suddenly the bishop is hanging, as is the queen. So there you have to walk into a queen trade. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because knight g5, knight f7 can be really strong even in an endgame. So queen e4 is interesting. But I think a far more circumspect move in this case. Let me think for a second. The problem with queen e2 is that black then can play rook f8. And suddenly the bishop on f4 becomes loose. That's one of the jobs that the queen was fulfilling. All right, I have an idea. I have an idea. We are actually going to play queen e4. We are going to play queen e4. And we're going to meet queen c6 with knight g5 anyway. So potentially we might get this into an end game where we have an extra pawn and a long lasting attack. But I think it's important here to keep the queen close enough to the other pieces. Queen c1, I think, is also a good move. But to be completely honest, queen c1, I was worried about dropping this e5 pawn which I think is also an integral attacker because it's closing off the bishop. It's just adding a lot of fuel to the fire. So I think it's more important to keep everything nicely compact and protected. Now, some of you might be wondering, what about the B2 pawn? Are we not worried about losing that pawn and then the knight's going to be hanging? Well, we can kind of ignore that. After knight takes B2, we can still go knight G5 and it should make sense to you that if black then takes the knight on C3, Knight f7 and knight takes d8 is just going to win back the rook immediately. And it's just going to lead to a totally devastating attack. So the queen side is of least concern, right? Everything's happening in this square of the board. Well, knight d2 is not really a source of danger. We have two minor pieces guarding that square. The bishop on f4 is ain't going anywhere. I'm not worried about this fork at all. Okay. So hopefully my explanations thus far have, have made sense. Our opponent is down to three minutes. This is getting iffy. Rook F8, great move by Black. Okay, um, let's think. Let's think. I have a really cool idea, but I don't think it quite works. White is better, but it ain't easy. We can go Knight G5, obviously, but the problem with Knight G5 is that then we drop the pawn on E5. I think we're going to make the move very tempted to play knight c3 to d5. My other candidate move is b3. But then black can actually sack the rook on f4 and collect the pawn on e5 and kind of break the floodgates open a little bit. Huh. Rook f8. Excellent defensive move. I think we're going to go with knight d5. I think we're going to go with knight to d5. This is a bit of a hard move to explain. Um, but the basic idea is that in the event of a trade on d5, the knight on c4 is going to be hanging. 
And on top of that, queen c6 is going to stop being a headache for us because there's, there's a piece on d5. If black plays queen c6 here, then we're still going to go knight to g5, which is a risky, risky approach. We have a lot of loose pieces there. But also e5 is not going to be hanging because the queen will have moved away from c7. So this is a way to try to simultaneously manage the threats of queen c6 and knight takes e5. Now, if I were black here, I would consider rook takes f4, queen takes f4, sacking the exchange back in order to collect this e5 pawn. But in that resulting position, white still has a long-lasting attack and white still has knight g5, so I think we're going to we're going to get the job done there. And we continue to poke and prod. Knight takes b2. Now, this has to be a mistake. Yeah, our opponent is getting very greedy. Now, we have two priorities in this position, two things that we can prioritize. We can go after the knight on b2, which is a very, very vulnerable knight, but it's going to be hard to trap it for tactical reasons. And the second thing we can prioritize is, of course, the move we wanted to play for like 17 years now, which is knight to g5. And I think that knight g5 is a good move. We can start by playing rook to c1, as some of you are indicating. You can absolutely throw in the move rook to c1, activate the rook first, but that's not, strictly speaking, necessary. All right, we can also just keep the rook on f1 for now. Um, queen d4 tr does trap the knight technically, but, but remember that the queen is also protecting the bishop on f4 and the rook is pressuring the bishop. So queen d4 doesn't actually create a threat. Let's instead go knight g5. I think we should first play this move. <clears throat> and then a little bit later, we'll see what's going on on the queen side. This is going to be close. I mean, this attack might succeed. It also might not succeed. I think I just missed a brilliant defensive resource. Let's see if our opponent finds it. But even in the event that this move is played, it's still incredibly dangerous for black. So that's the great thing about these attacks. It's like even when your opponent finds a bunch of good defensive moves, it doesn't, the game doesn't end. And there, I think, is the panic move. Okay, queen takes f4. So obviously, notice that knight f7 check here would be a very common, very, very bad move. Okay, our opponent collapses. Our opponent collapses uh, and, and carries out the right idea, but in the, wrong, in the wrong moment. Yeah, so there's a couple of ways to punish this. A lot of you guys are seeing queen takes e5 check, which is a very pretty move, followed by knight f7, knight takes e5, up a piece. But, but you have a huge attack. So there's zero reason to actually trade queens here, unless you're forced to do so. I like starting with knight f7 check. Oh, queen f7 is just mate, yeah. Or no, no, it was not made. Black at e6. Queen f7, black at e6. Which I, I will admit, I didn't see queen f7. But I'll, I'll show you after the game. No, queen f7, e6, yeah. No, there was no mate on h7 there because the queen on c7 was protecting it. Okay, black walks into another discovery. And here, a lot of players would struggle to find the most accurate execution. There is a very nice move in this position that ends the game immediately. So... Of course, there's nothing wrong with knight takes e5 check. But let me walk you through kind of my logic here. So knight h6 check is a bad move. Because then the king just steps up to g7. What is your idea? Knight h6 check, king g7, no follow-up. So what I see is that the queen and the bishop are defending each other, technically. So there's another move, which it, I think it's harder to see this move because it doesn't... I mean, it just looks very weird, but it's actually incredibly strong. And that's the move. Um, so knight d8 check is, I think, also winning. But the move I want to play is knight to d6 check. That's the, that's the move we're going to end up playing. So this is a check, first of all. It's a check. The idea is, is to sever the connection between the queen and the bishop so that we can take on e5 with our queen. And not only do we want to take on e5 with our queen... That's going to be a check because the black king has only two escape squares, g7 and h8. After king h8, queen takes e5 is made in one because the bishop covers g8. After king g7, queen takes e5 check. The king has then two retreating squares. There's king f8, then queen h8 is mate. And if king h6, then we again use the placement of the knight on d6 and move it away to f7. That is also simply checkmate. 
But even if it weren't checkmate, it would win the queen on c7. So it's just one of those moves. Yeah, that's it. Queen takes e5. It's mate in two, actually, from this position. And here we go, queen h8 with mate. Yeah, very nicely played by our opponent. Kudos. Not an easy game at all. So let's review. Let's review. That was that was a pretty rich game. How did I find this? Pro I mean, method of exhaustion. You just look at all the night moves. I think people really underestimate. When you have a potential discovered check, just look at all of them and spend 5, 10 seconds on each potential uh, each potential discovery. So, uh, well, again, our opponent played well, but how, again, I, as I always say, how, how would you feel if you played a really good game and you tried your best and then, you know, an entire chat was just randomly accusing you of cheating or stream sniping? So that's, that's not right. I, again, I always make it clear if I'm actually suspicious of someone, it was very clear from the first moves, this guy is totally legit. So just maybe underrated or, you know, played a, played a really nice game. Okay. So we played an Alp in Sicilian, c3, knight f6, e5, knight d5, d4, cd. This is all mainline stuff. And uh, first important moment is here. Don't forget to play the move knight f3. The downside of playing c takes d4 is that you're, well, there's really no downside. I mean, most of the time it transposes after knight f3, knight c6 to the main line. But there's just this additional option you're giving black of playing the immediate d takes e5. So it doesn't really matter. But uh, the move knight f3 is, is how the clinical players, players, players play it. So knight f3, black responds with knight c6, main line. And now c takes d4. Um, so here, the main move by far, is, as I pointed out, is the move d6. And this move should make perfect sense to everybody. You're opening up the bishop. You're chipping away at white's center. And this frequently leads to an isolated queen pawn position. So I'll quickly rattle off the main line from this position. Usually white plays bishop to c4, attacking the knight on d5. The knight drops back to b6 with tempo. The bishop moves up to b5, pinning the knight on c6. And now you get this series of trades, d e5, Knight e5 attacking knight on c6 from two different sources. Black defends with bishop d7. And most of the time, white grabs the bishop to get the bishop pair. And here you get this classic isolated queen pawn position where both sides have very clearly defined assets. White has the bishop pair. And in a position with a relatively open center, a bishop pair is pretty valuable. Whereas black, of course, has... A direct pressure on white's weak isolated pawn as well as full control well not full control but relatively good control of the square in front of the pawn which i've pointed out many times is one of the most important aspects of iqp positions who has control in, of the square in front of of the pawn can you make sure that it's a steady target but in many situations the move d4 d5 actually comes a lot faster than you might expect. So for example, the main continuation here is Castle's Kingside. And now recent books have recommended for Black to move A6 here, immediately resolving the situation with the pin. But the old main line, and this is what people used to play automatically, is just the developing move Bishop E7. And Bishop E7... Oh, and we have a question from Lost in the Woods. Why does black play e6 and not take the pawn? You cannot take the pawn here because after queen takes d4, the knight is pinned. You can't move the knight. It's pinned to the king. So this pawn is currently untouchable. And the reason you don't play g6 here is because white plays d5, right? You need to immobilize the pawn. Here you lose the knight on c6. That's okay. Questions are good. So bishop e7 is the move. What is the drawback of the move bishop e7? Now, you might say drawback. I mean, it's just a developing move. Developing moves don't have drawbacks. Well, almost every move is a drawback. And most of the time, the drawback has to do with losing control of something it was previously defending. In this case, there's this g7 pawn, which can be attacked with a move queen to g4. Very important move. On this move hinges the, the entire variation, queen g4. So black castles kingside in order to defend it. 
And now, unfortunately, bishop h6 does not quite work. Who can tell me why? If you're watching on YouTube, pause the video. Try to figure out why bishop h6 is wrong here. It's actually a blunder. And it's not what you might think. It's not what you might think. Nobody's gotten it so far. This is a trick question. It's a trick question. There we go. Very good. It's not bishop f6, which is a solid defensive move, but this transposes back into the main line. But here, suddenly black has queen takes d4. And everything works out for black. You're defending g7. The knight defends the queen. The knight's no longer pinned because the king is now castled. And white loses a pawn, simply. White simply loses a pawn. Um, so yeah, you can't play bishop h6 here. First, you need to eliminate the knight on c6 to protect the d4 pawn. And not only now, after bc... You play bishop h6, bishop f6. And now you bring the rook into d1 in order to protect d4. And the game goes on. I had a game here against another GM that I won. White is considered slightly better in this position. Knight from c3 comes up to e4. And this is a very, very well-known line of the Alapin, which has been contested now for many decades. Tons of games in the database. You can dig around here if you want. But that's one of the main theoretical lines, is this entire brouhaha with... Uh, starting with the move d6. Hopefully that made, you know, general logical sense. But there's also a ton of sidelines. Like I'm showing you this line and on each move, both sides generally have like a ton of different sidelines. For example, in this position, black can play the move d takes e5, defending the knight with the queen and white recaptures. And now you can get a bunch of end games. Like a while back, this line with knight d to b4 was really popular. I still think this line basically equalizes for black. Um, you can also play the more sort of conservative move e6, which is the drawback of closing down the bishop, but it protects the knight on d5. Yeah, I won that game. I won a nice game in that line. But here white is considered slightly better. This is a little passive for black. So we will get to these lines as we get more Alpin games, but for now, let's get to g6. And uh, here, I actually think I don't... I'm not sure I responded in the most accurate way. I'm going to consult my Alapin book because this is a opening theme speedrun. I want to do, do it properly. I'm sure G6 is analyzed. The move G6 would be a good decision for black after comp play, but white can force immediately his opponent to weaken the dark squares. Okay, so they recommend, they recommend queen to B3 here, which is a version of bishop C4, but it doesn't allow knight B6 with tempo. Apparently, queen b3 gives a big advantage. Now, if the knight drops back, then you have the move d5, and the pawns are set in motion. This is terrible for black. Black has nowhere to go, and e5 is protected. So black has to play the very weakening move e6. And again, this weakens these dark squares. And now you go knight c3, getting rid of black's knight. And now they give knight takes c3, bc. And what's interesting, if b6, they just give h4, start attacking on the king side, h4 and h5. And if d6 or d5, then e takes d6, bishop takes d6, and again, h4. This very interesting idea, h4, h5, and just go after the h file, given how weak black is on the king side. And it's basically plus minus. So that's actually the refutation. You go queen to b3. Bishop c4 is a little bit inaccurate because it allows the knight to drop back with tempo. Bishop b3. I still think white is slightly better here, but not as much as after queen b3. Um, in any case, so black plays d6. And now we played queen to e2, getting the queen out of the line of fire of black's queen. No, the, there's no PDF available. I think you have to buy the book. So bishop to g7, castles, castles, and h3. Uh, and h3 to prevent bishop g4. So just as I was explaining before the game, bishop g4 is a very thematic tactical blunder uh, because of bishop takes f7 check. Something that you should memorize once and for all if you've never seen this before. The idea, uh, deflect the king to f7. Now knight g5 is a check. King has to move back. And queen takes g4. Not only has this one a pawn, 
but it's also exposed massive weaknesses in the center. 96 is now a huge threat. Black's King is totally in shambles. The one little modification to this tactic that you should know is that in some cases, um, if the G5 square is protected by Black's Queen, you have to be very careful that in this position, Black can't play Queen takes G5. Because sometimes even if you can then take Black's Queen, remember that White's Queen is also hanging. So I've seen a lot of players lose a piece like that. I don't have a instance of that in mind right now, but just more abstractly. But after Black Castles, of course, Bishop takes F7 is no longer effective because the Rook also protects this square. So here we already have to play H3. The book is called Squeezing the Sicilian by Kalifman and Solovyov. So DEDE -D -E is on the board. Black plays queen c7, and we bring our bishop out to defend e5. Black brings their bishop out as well. We get our knight out to c3. This is all totally normal. And of course, here came Black's big mistake, rook f to d8. What should Black have done instead? Well, it was the right idea to bring the rook to d8. It was just the wrong rook. Black should have brought this rook to d8 in order to keep the other one to protect this all-important weakness on f7. Now, in response, I was planning to do the same thing, rook a to d1. And I think white is definitely slightly better here. No question about it. White is slightly better. More space. Nice position. But one plan that black could implement here is to ask himself, well, what is white's strongest piece? What is white's most annoying piece? Well, it's actually the bishop on b3. The bishop is what's preventing black from doing the stuff that they want to do. What is it that black wants to do? Well, ideally, black wants to take and go rook d8 and trade all the pieces off. But this is not possible because, again, of this bishop takes f7 tactic. So you might say, oh, well, then let's trade the bishops with bishop to e6. But that's also a very bad move from a positional standpoint. Look what you're doing to your pawn structure and look what you're doing to your other bishop. So is there a way to actually control the c8 square with another piece? So there's two ways of doing that. You can try to go knight a5 and force White's bishop back to c2. But here you're allowing bishop f7 anyway. This is a beautiful tactic. Now, you might say, well, didn't you just say rook takes f7 happens? No, but after e6, note the consequence of knight c6 to a5. What was the knight doing on c6? It was protecting the rook on d8. So now after queen takes f4, if the knight were to be on c6 here, black is fine. Black has two pieces for a rook. Now you simply take another rook on d8. So a really, really cool tactic. That's why you always have to pay attention to what's going on on the main open file. So the move here, the best move, and I just checked the engine, is queen c7 to c8. This is a super high class positional move. You should pay attention to it. It gets the queen out of the line of fire of the bishop. But more importantly, it prepares the move bishop f5 to e6, eliminating white's strongest piece. Um, so there's not much that white can do about that. Like queen e3, bishop back to e6, and black should be able to equalize with a couple more careful moves. Queen c8 is a, is a phenomenal positional move. Um, it's a move that shows that you understand the position. So black in the game makes this big tactical mistake, rook f d8, allowing bishop takes f7 but correctly reacts with king h8. And we decided that the most important thing was to keep this bishop alive. And we dropped it back to b3, sacrificing the exchange. Once again, the reason I didn't attend to this threat, of course, ideally we would make a move like rook f to d1, but the problem is the move e6. And the bishop on f7 is trapped and it's hanging. And if you protect it with knight g5, black can just dislodge the knight with h6. This is the problem, right? And you might say, well, don't you have like knight takes e6 here? Not really. Because black first takes on d1 with check, and then takes on f7 with the queen and keeps the extra piece. That doesn't work. Now maybe white can get out of this with some sacrifices or some knight b5 moves. But now the queen slides over to e7 and keeps contact with the bishop. So... I didn't like this. Yeah, you can play g4 here. You actually probably have to. And 
What's funny is that Black's bishop is also trapped. But now you're creating major weaknesses on the king's side. And after queen takes f7, gf, queen takes f5, black has won a pawn out of this operation. And black's going to win another one on h3 on the next move. And white's king side is in shambles. So not a good outcome here for white. So that's why I didn't play rook fd1. I considered the move knight to b5 here straight away. But I didn't like it because after queen d7, the threat of bishop d3 becomes even stronger. Because now the knight's also loose. So I thought maybe e6, but now the queen drops into d3. And it basically has the same effect that the bishop, the move bishop d3 has. It's also a fork. And in the event of a queen trade, now you get the actual fork and white loses more material. And the bishop is trapped on f7. So largely, I found bishop b3 by process of elimination. Sacking an exchange is the, you know, the most innocuous of the sacrifices, and it keeps all of the attacking options alive. So bishop d3, queen e3, takes, takes, and knight to a5 by black, a good defensive move, and bishop to e6. So once again, I, I was contemplating the move knight g5 instead, and I was calculating the line knight takes b3, knight f7 check, king g8, knight takes d8, and suddenly rook takes d8 ab with an extra pawn for white. This would have been the less adventurous way to just solidify the advantage, but I wanted to checkmate, so we wanted to keep the bishop alive. Bishop to e6. Knight a c4, and moving the queen up to e4. Lost in the Woods asked, did you ever consider attacking by pushing the h-pawn going after the hook on g6? Yes, but it would be too slow. Such attacking ideas are good when the center is closed. When the center is wide open, essentially you have two moves. I mean, every move has to create a threat, because look how much is going on you know in the on the king's on the queen side and in the center you just don't have the time for a three move idea otherwise yes the h4 h5 is very thematic in such positions no question oh hey theopen midget i think our opponent has popped into the chat um you played fantastic so what's funny is that if we rewind a little bit sorry no if we fast forward about a little bit here 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 there is a move which comes incredibly close to leading to a beautiful checkmate. And this is a stock theme that I've shown many times before. Anytime there is a bishop controlling the g8 square and there is an h7 g6 formation, you should be aware of the possibility of sacrificing something on g6, drawing the pawn away from h7, and then opening up the h file and delivering a checkmate on that h file. So how do we, what is the, the, the actual execution of this idea here? What's well, the move knight to h4 um, with the idea of sacking on g6? So for example, let's make a random move for black. Now knight takes g6 works like a charm and leads to forced checkmate. You don't care how much you give away because as long as you keep the bishop alive, you're going to have a mating pattern like this. Something worth remembering. Um, and this is checkmate. And it's actually not easy, it's not possible for black to defend the g6 pawn. The problem, again, is that knight h4 loses control of the e5 pawn. And black can play simply the move knight c4 takes e5. And we have a problem, right? If you play knight g6 stubbornly, then after hg, well, you can play bishop e5, but at the end of the day, this is no longer checkmate because of queen to h5 blocking the check this just doesn't work out does that make sense it just doesn't work out so knight h4 is a good try but knight takes e5 puts it to bed um unfortunate so anyways we decided on this move knight to d5 basically refresh uh one sec sorry it disconnected me for a moment there Okay, ruining the coordination between black's pieces on the queen side. Why not the immediate knight g5 is what most people probably wonder. Knight, nothing wrong with knight g5. I think knight g5 is also a great move. I think knight g5 is a great move as well. I was, to be honest, worried about knight takes e5. But apparently, according to the engine, there is this weird move, bishop back to g3. Just to eliminate, eliminate problems with rook takes f4. 
And you're you're essentially just keeping a massive attack on Black Saint. Knight F7 is a threat using the pin against Black's Queen. Yeah, this would have still been very, very strong. But we decided on the move Knight T5, playing a little bit on both sides of the board. And after Knight takes B2, Knight G5, I mean, it's such an unpleasant situation for Black. And here our opponent panics. I think that Black's last chance in this position would have been to use the fact that the queen on e4 is a little bit overloaded. It's protecting the bishop. And it's trying to supervise, you know, it's trying to put this knight under house arrest. So what move comes to mind as a way of exploiting the overextended nature of the queen? Trying to reduce the tension a little bit on the king side. Yeah, knight b4 to d knight b2 to d3 would have been very strong here. Knight d3. And the idea is after queen d3, you play rook takes f4, and you're using your extra material as a bargaining chip. Again, as, as you often do when you're defending. So a lot of you might say, hey, but what about knight e6? But that's the whole point. You're, you're saying, come take my exchange. At least I've gotten rid of the knight. And black is actually totally fine here. Material is equal. This is a, an equal position. So after knight d3, white is probably best advised to not take the knight and instead to move the bishop back and keep the attack going. But here, maybe black can get away with bishop takes e5. And, I don't know, knight e6. The engine gives queen to c3. Very difficult position to understand. But at the end of the day, you're going to get something like, something like this, where the engine gives plus 1.3. So white is still much better. The attack continues. But perhaps black could have preserved practical defensive chances with this very strong move knight d3 but not an easy move to, to to play or to find and it's not easy to follow up after bishop g3 so rook takes f4 is a totally understandable panic move and after queen f4 i think it's already basically over maybe black should try h6 and this by the way is something that a lot of players forget about this move h6 as a way of defending against the potential uh, knight f7 is easily forgotten about. The idea is to create a Luft square on h7. And I once saved a game like that, which I've shown before. A game that looked like it was over. It looked like knight f7 was coming and it was going to lead to smothered mate. This is from my first World Youth Chess Championship. We reach this position. My opponent thinks that he finds a straight up win. And he ends up winning the tournament, actually. Sahaj Grover is now a GM. He won the under 10 section um, with like a monster score. So he plays rook takes e6. And this is a very scary looking move. F takes e6, queen takes e6, king h8, knight g5. And then suddenly he offers me a draw. And it looks terrifying. Looks like knight f7 is coming. But in fact, this is a complete paper tiger for the same reason that we are discussing right now. With what simple move can black put all of the threats to bed? h6 yeah a just h6 with the idea of meeting knight f7 check with king to h7 nice little square for the king sidestepping all of the threats now the reason i took the draw is because i thought that white can achieve a perpetual check with knight g5 check i thought this was a perpetual because after, well if king h8 then obviously this is a repetition of moves um but here white has the retreating check, queen e6 to h3, king g8, queen to e6, and there seems to be no way of sidestepping the checks. What did I miss? Who can see what I missed? And as a hint, I'll reach this position. Well, king g6, queen e6. Yeah, very good. Twinkle Toes got it. King g6, queen e6, and now the bishop suddenly comes back from the dead and covers on f6. There's no more checks. But not, not what somebody else pointed out, which is king h8 and queen h7, which doesn't work as you drop the rook on the other side of the board. So it's not that. It's king g6 and bishop f6 would have defended. Of course, white does not have to sack the knight, but then white is down a pawn and he's losing another one and there's no compensation. There's no attack on the king. So just remember this idea of meeting knight g5 with h6. You don't always have to get smothered mated in those situations. Uh, these attacks aren't as dangerous as they seem. Now, obviously, compared to the speedrun game here, we're also up a pawn. 
Here we're also up a pawn and we have a huge attack going. So we can drop the bishop back to e4 and attack g6. This is completely winning. It's like plus four. And now, by the way, h4, h5 becomes a very serious idea. Um, but this may, may, may have prolonged the game. Bishop f e5, knight f7 check. And last thing here, just considering all of the possible knight retreats, right? Yields the move knight d6. There's no magical way of finding knight d6. You just have to stumble onto it. And the idea, again, is to block the connection between the queen and the bishop so that you can take on e5 with the queen and set up another discovery against black's queen. But that doesn't even matter because this is simply checkmate. It doesn't matter if there was a zebra on c7. In any case, that concluded the game. So it was a, okay, our opponent played king f8 and walked into this mate. Yeah, you just try all the discoveries and, and you calculate them and that's all there is to it. And of course, also, black could have prolonged the game with e6, but we just played bishop takes e6 here. That's that, folks. Thank you for watching. Thank you for hanging out. And uh, again, everybody who supports me on YouTube and on Twitch keeps the content going. See y'all later. Bye.